Okay, so um, thanks for the introduction and thanks everyone for being here. So yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about satellite data for smoke and fire, and I'm also going to talk some about the application of satellite data for smoke and fire. So myself and uh, my colleague, uh, Sean Raffuse uh, from UC Davis, um, are going to be conducting the talk here. So first, I just wanted to start out, and I want to start out with a picture of fire activity across the entire US. Um, because really, we live in a, um, in a world where nat fire is a natural part of many of our ecosystems. And so I think this figure of satellite data showing the uh, most 2017 fire detections really um, helps try, uh, try, um, tell part of that story. And also, it's not just always about the big, large wildfires that, you know, make the news, but it's also um, there's fire all across the landscape. And it's not just large Western wildfires. And so um, that's what I like about this figure is it shows the seasonality of fire occurrence across the nation as well. And so I've been using this figure for, or different variations of this figure for many years now. Um, thanks to Sean for creating the original version of this with, um, you know, much older fire detections out there. MODIS has been around for a while. So what, um, what we're seeing here are fire detections as seen by the MODIS um, instrument. And it's just a, a hotspot detection. It's not a measure of fire radiative power. It's not a measure of fire size. It's just the satellite seeing a hotspot. And they're color coded by um, seasonality. They're color coded by month. So the blue dots are November and December, January and February. So you can see the large signature of fire occurring across the entire southeastern US and also in other parts of the US, such as central California or in the Northwest, where a lot of pile burning is done, for example, over the wintertime period. And then as things start to warm up, we start seeing fire move progressively um, south and west as well. So we start seeing um, the light green uh, dots are fire detections in March and April. And there you can see the signature of uh, lots of burning that's done for um, in the Flint Hills of Kansas and Oklahoma, for example, where about 2 million acres, I believe, are burned per year there. And so you see that. Then the green dots are May and June. Fire continues progressing north. And then finally, the orange and red dots are July, August, September, and October. And that's where you can really see the signature of summer wildfire season. So we live in a fire, um, you know, we live in a fire adaptive ecology in many of these places, and fire is needed to maintain many of these um, ecologies. So fire happens, and with fire, we have smoke. And um, smoke can be, as many of you know, it can be harmful, you know, is harmful to us. It can be harmful to inhale. The fine small particulates can work their ways past the body's natural defenses into the lungs and perhaps even into the bloodstream and can be quite dangerous and especially for people that already have pre-existing conditions such as, um, such as asthma, COPD. So, um, so with fire, we have smoke. And so one of the, uh, one of the things that my um, involvement in HATECAST has been, has been with um, modeling smoke using satellite information for smoke and information and ultimately information for um, health and air quality people out there. And so one of the things that um, I've been working on, been working on with Sean and others, is the um, Northern California, uh, California, Northern California Wildfires Tiger Team project. And so this is a project that was spun up specifically to address the um, five wildfires that occurred in the Napa wine country in 2017 in October, and they were quite devastating in many ways. And as part of that, um, millions of people were also exposed to um, high concentrations of smoke, high concentrations of PM 2.5. So I'm not going to try and cover um, this entire project. I'm just going to highlight a few of the things that um, we've been working on as part of this project using satellite information for smoke and fire. And I'd also want to point, I also want to point you towards recordings of um, two of uh, our Tiger Team KCAST um, collaborators, contributors, um, Ming Wei Dao and Jason West. They did some really nice presentations too as part of this series, um, presenting some of the work as a part of, of this Tiger Team. And um, the other notable thing about this Tiger Team is that there ended up being over 80 um, people, um, stakeholders, collaborators, 
involved to some extent in this Tiger team. And that was, um, you know, a testament of the level of interest and level of concern there is with these wildfires and with the smoke impacts. So the first thing we did as part of this um, Tiger team was we needed to calculate emissions. That was the first step in trying to um, essentially model these wildfires with using the CMAC modeling system, thanks to Bay Area Air Quality Management District, and then ultimately getting that information to um, health researchers such as Jason West and his students who are using that and this in some of their work. So we needed to calculate fire emissions. And we used two approaches to calculating fire emissions. And um, I'm calling them a bottom-up and a top-down approach. So the bottom-up approach is fundamentally using information that's on the land. Um, it's using mapped fuel loadings of fuels on the landscape um, to get our fuels information. And then it's using models, con fuel consumption models, to calculate how much of that vegetation will burn and applying measured emission factors to getting at a quantity of emissions. The other approach is using a top-down approach, which is based for the most part purely on just remotely sensed data. And so using uh, fire radiative power as a means to calculate emissions. And for this work, uh, we use the NASA FEAR uh, fire energetics and emissions research algorithm. And um, Sean will probably cover that more when he talks um, in this presentation. But I want, what I wanted to do with this figure is to show that there's many similarities um, with these two approaches. I think sometimes we think that there's um, a lot of differences with um, calculating emissions from a ground up approach versus a top down approach. And um, there's differences and there's a lot of similarities here too. And um, because for example, when you calculate emissions, um, you get a quantity of emissions. And usually that's for assumed to be a quantity of emissions that um, is uh, coming off the fire for a particular day. Well, you need to estimate then the temporal allocation of those emissions. How much is emitted per hour and then how much, how those emissions are allocated vertically in the atmosphere as well. And so both of these approaches share the need to get at um, assumptions and means of uh, fulfilling those needs so we can get this four-dimensional output that can go into our air quality modeling systems. And then also, um, each of these boxes that you see on these figures are um, areas of research in themselves. And there's a lot of um, variability and uncertainty associated with each of these boxes. And we could try to draw bars on those as well. But for example, with fuel characteristics, fuel information on the landscape, there can easily be an order of magnitude um, difference in fuel estimation just based on you know, the different mappings that you might use. So there's a lot of um, variability and uncertainty also associated with each of these components. <clears throat> and then finally, I wanted to note that even with the bottom-up approach, what we call a bottom-up approach, um, satellite information is a key player in this as well in many of the approaches that have, approaches that have been used. And so first I want to talk about calculating emissions and some of our results from the 2017 Northern California wildfire tiger team. Excuse me, my voice. <laughs> um, so the first thing I wanted to do is share a couple of results with uh, using the bottom-up approach. So when I say bottom-up approach, I'm using a system called Blue Sky, the Blue Sky Smoke Modeling Framework. You'll see that abbreviated BSF in some of the slides here as well. And so that's a system that I've been working on for many years now, um, helping develop and use uh, to calculate fire emissions and to do um, smoke modeling. And so using the Blue Sky system, uh, calculating PM2.5 emissions, there is a couple things I wanted to point out as far as with the relationship between PM2.5 emissions and fuel type and fire area. So with these, um, Let's see, with these five Northern California wildfires, there were 10 different fuel types that were identified from the map fuel loadings that we used. Um, we used the fuel characteristic classification system. And so in these two figures on the y-axis um, are those 10 uh, different uh, fuel categories. And they've been, broadly, um, they've been broadly categorized as grassland, shrubland, forest, Oak woodland, and then there was an urban kind of miscellaneous, um, all other non-wildland fire category um, 
category. And so we have the fuel type on the y-axis and then on the x-axis is fraction. And so in the left panel, it's the fraction of fire area attributed to each fuel type. And on the right panel, it's the fraction of PM2.5 emissions attributed to each fuel type. And so one thing that jumps out at me here is that um, PM2.5 emissions are not necessarily directly related to fire area because 10% of the area burned, so with that second fuel type from the top, um, and in the forest, it's one of the forest fuel types. That one fuel type was responsible for about 10% of the area burned, but responsible for about 62% of the PM2.5 emissions. So it, it becomes something of a more complex, complex picture, and you really can't just look at fire size. You really need to look at the fuel type as well um, when looking at um, fire PM2.5 emissions. And so with that, so that was the bot a look at the fuels relationship of fuels and calculating fire emissions with a bottom up type approach with fuels information. We also calculated emissions using uh, the NASA FEAR algorithm for the uh, five large uh, wildfires. So the Atlas, Nun, Pocket, Redwood Valley, and Tubbs wildfires. And the blue bars here are the PM2.5 emission estimates in pounds per acre based on using the NASA FEAR algorithm, which uses a uh, fire rate of power. And then the orange is based on using uh, the blue sky system to calculate fire emissions. And so on first glance here, it looks like something of a mixed bag. In some cases, the NASA FEAR algorithm was higher. And in other cases, the blue sky approach was higher. Um, but then we looked at the fuels information. And so that's what you see in the parentheses here on the x-axis as well is the predominant fuel types for those different fires and they're different and so what we kind of what we see here then is that for the lighter fuels the um, the shrubs and the grasses um, and the light forest types um, the NASA fear algorithm would yield a higher PM 2.5 estimate I went too far with my thing there and then um, and then vice versa with the heavier fuel system with the nun um, fire, it was in a uh, it was in a heavier forested uh, fuel type. Uh, that's when the case when the blue sky system estimated higher emissions. And then with the pocket fire, they were both very similar. So looking, so I think there's more to the story here, and we're investigating this further with the um, 2018 Cal uh, California wildfires as well at this point. So I wanted to point that out. And then also the other thing with these two approaches that was actually quite heartening is that I think overall they are more similar and different than different in the sense that um, the biggest difference here is about a factor of five between one estimation method and the other. And that's not bad when we're talking about comparing different um, emission estimate approaches for uh, wildland fire. So they're well within the same order of magnitude. And so there's been other work done that have um, compared different uh, emission estimation methods um, with these different um, satellite-based approaches and ground-based approaches. They tend to take a um, larger, more national or global approach. And so this is uh, very you know, focused on you know, this very specific situation here, um, the Northern California wildfires. Okay, there we go. <laughs> And so that was one thing I wanted to mention. So that was um, looking at the uh, using satellite information and the mix of um, uh, ground-based information to calculate PM2.5 emissions from fires. And actually, we calculated a whole suite of emissions and just using PM2.5 as the, um, as the uh, you know, example estimate here. And so the other thing I wanted to briefly cover, or not briefly, because we'll, um, Sean's going to talk more about this also, is then the temporal allocation of emissions. And so we need to take this quantity of emissions and allocate it hour by hour in order to get it into our model. And, um, and that's not always that's not always easy, or we've used what we call a default approach where the um, where the emissions are assumed for a wildfire are assumed to have a maximum occurrence 
um, kind of mid late afternoon, about 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And um, I was working with uh, an air resource advisor that was deployed on a wildfire in California. This was the Whittier wildfire outside of Santa Barbara in Santa Barbara County. And uh, this is a case where that default diurnal profile uh, failed. It, um, they had sundowner, what were called, what are called sundowner winds that occur that are hot, um, dry, very windy winds, uh, strong winds that occur uh, late afternoon, early evening into the night. And what they did was they would fan the fire behavior. So there would become, there would be a lot of emissions occurring into the evening hours that essentially um, smoke models were not, were not capturing at all. And essentially smoke models were turning off the emissions at the time when emissions were actually ramping up on this fire. So using the newly available GO16 data, GO16 is, is just, this data has just been amazing to work with. Uh, data are available every five minutes at a two to four kilometer resolution. And so using um, the newly available GO16 data, we were able to construct a diurnal profile that more closely reflected what was going on with the Whittier wildfire um, during this time period. And this was in July of 2017. And so here's just an example of a smoke modeling run near surface PM2.5 concentrations calculated with this modified direct diurnal profile from the Whittier fire. And in this case, this is at 4 a.m. in the morning of the fire. So this was, this was helpful, this was useful. Um, and so that sort of, that started work that Sean and I have continued then working with, um, working together on using this GO16 data. And so at this point then, I'm going to segue over to Sean and he's going to talk about um, some of the work that we've been doing using GO16 to um, data to not only create diurnal profiles, but also to calculate fire emissions using the FEAR algorithm. And so I'll turn it over to you, Sean. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, Susan mentioned a little bit about the uh, GO16 data. Um, and so I've been working in the last uh, year or so uh, at trying to understand and use this data to get a sense of uh, fire activity. And you know, the exciting thing about the GO16 data compared to what we've had in the past is um, it's high time resolution. Um, this uh, five minute time resolution as well as um, pretty good spatial resolution. And um, because before we had older GOES instruments that did have this fairly high time resolution, but um, lower spatial resolution and less sensitivity. So now we have um, something that's useful for, um, uh, more useful for smoke modeling that can give us this uh, sort of up to the minute picture of fire. Uh, in the past, we've really been reliant on um, MODIS and also VIRS, which, which are very good, but only provide snapshots of the fire, say, um, morning or the afternoon, perhaps overnight, but just these instantaneous snapshots. And from those, we have to infer some sort of diurnal profile of how the fire is going. And so um, in my work, I uh, um, ended up uh, creating a small tool um, because that's just how I, how I work, I guess. And um, so I'm gonna show that here just, just to uh, get, a, get a sense of the data. So let's see, make sure, okay. So this is uh, the tool uh, and this was designed mostly for, <laughs> initially for internal use for exploration. And so you can see the URL there, but it's not, uh, you'll, if you try and go there, you'll see it's, it's, it's password protected. And we can uh, talk later about people getting access to it, but um, it was, you know, it's not designed for a hundred people. Or one. Um, at any rate, what we're seeing here is um, I've highlighted three days in the past, uh, four days in the past actually, um, and the dots here are the GO16 fire detection product. Um, I've, uh, there's a couple of uh, mask values over here on the right-hand side. Basically, you could show all the different satellite detections, but these, um, some of them are very uh, uh, low probability of being fires. There's problems with false alarms, false detects, uh, cloud interference, things like that. And so I'm only showing by default here the ones that are most um, uh, likely to be fires. And so uh, 
this is connected to uh, a database that Susan's group houses and keeps updated on a kind of an hourly basis. Um, so we can move around here. If I zoom into Central America, you'll notice things jumping around, okay? The first, so these plots down below here are uh, different views of the uh, time of the fire above here. So this, this window here says from 2018, 1107, 1800 uh, UTC to 1112. Um, these are all the fire detects for uh, this region. And these uh, time series down here correspond to the view that we're seeing in the map. So it's automatically gated. So if I zoom in a little bit, then these will re-update and only show what's shown right in here. And so, you know, in Central America, there's often a lot of fire activity. And what you can see in these plots right here is that it's very diurnal and regular and cyclical. Um, just a quick idea of the, the plots we have here on the first one on the left is a fire pixel count. This is just, you know, within this map view, how many detects, uh, you know, uh, do we have? And, you know, that's peaking up at, you know, 10 to 12 here. Every, um, and these are, uh, and again, these are at five minute increments. So in that five minute increment. Um, fire area, this is the sum of the fire areas as reported from the sensor itself. Um, we don't actually use these in our modeling yet because um, the, the, this data, well, what, it's not 100% uh, reliable. We don't always have it. Um, it's only available in some of the highest quality masks. Um, the next one here is uh, fire radiative energy. So that's um, the sensor itself reports uh, fire radiative power. Um, that's right here, say power, 19.27 uh, megawatts. And then a fire radiative energy is just that power multiplied by the time window, which is a five minute window. So that's a total um, and over the five minutes. And the reason we are interested in this, of course, is as Susan mentioned, there's the, the top-down approaches like the um, fear method can use this fire radiative energy um, and multiply it that by that some factor um, to develop an estimate of particulate matter emissions. And so that's what's shown on here on the right. This is taking that fire radiative energy, um, intersecting it with a surface layer, which has um, basically the coefficient for this particular region. Um, if you have this much energy, how much total particles will you get? And then uh, making an estimate of PM2.5. And so um, you know, we can zoom around. This was November, if we go in here, you'll see there's a lot of action here in Florida, south of Lake Okeechobee. This is um, turn on the, uh, say the imagery, and you can kind of see that these are cropland burn. Um, I believe this is uh, sugarcane. And, um, you know, it's also in kind of this regular pulse, but uh, lower intensity. But if I zoom back out here, I can say the topo map. Look at the whole country or the whole continent. Um, uh, the reason I picked this is that we can um, zoom back in over here. Um, so here we see a giant cluster of pixels, and this is um, this is the Camp Wildfire um, that burned over Paradise, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with. Um, it was, you know, the largest and most uh, destructive wildfire in California history in terms of uh, damage and death. Um, but uh, what's interesting about this data is is not that we have these detects of the campfire because it's, this is a huge fire. It was very easy for any of the satellites to see it, but it is really to look at the, um, the way that the fire progressed and to look at the time profiles. And um, so let's see if we go and it started here, I can figure that out. You can see when I, when I move this bar here, it, it, it creates this blue line. So that's kind of the, uh, uh, shows what's on the screen. So here, this is the very beginning of the fire. And you can see in terms of pixel counts, we have just a few in the first, the first bit, but then, you know, and the fire burned here, uh, but it, it increased uh, very rapidly grew. Um, and you can see hour by hour the way uh, it came down. And there was this first initial pulse where it really had this uh, strong run. And then it had an even bigger run after that where it really came down. And that, and that not only that um, in terms of the number of pixels, but in terms of the energy and in terms of the PM 2.5. 
And um, finally, you know, when we go to sort of the full full breadth, you can see how it made it all the way down to uh, down to the freeway and um, basically engulfed the town of Paradise and got into got into Chico. Um, and if you look um, here at this, uh, say the PM 2.5 here is at uh, 200,000. Um, that's 200,000 kilograms in uh, five minutes per five minutes. Um, if I zoom out, remember that it will encompass all the fires in that zoom window, and you can watch how that y-axis, even though I you know zoom out to say all of North America, it, it doesn't really go up much because the, this this fire here is is dominating um, in that time period. And so what we're interested in is, of course, is, is modeling this and trying to understand the time uh, profile and, and putting that into the model. And so we had a, a method for doing that. So I'm just going to uh, click that. So campfire, and then we know it burned 150,000 acres. And um, so basically, this is behind the scenes, uh, taking this time profile information and putting it into the format um, that Susan needs to run the blue sky model. And that's how we were able to produce um, emission estimates for uh, several fires um, in 2018 for an emission inventory um, with the Bay Area. Now, I'm going to go back. And this plot here kind of shows the, the punchline and what uh, what Susan was talking about, what, which they did originally by hand on that previous slide on a previous fire with the sundowner winds, is that this black line is is the diurnal profile that we've been uh, assuming for all wildfires because um, we didn't have information on an individual fire basis, hour by hour or minute by minute, and the um, this orange line is what we get from the time profile if we um, use something like the GOES data. And you can see, you know, uh, the model will miss that the, the fact that there was this explosive activity, you know, early in the morning, something that is not typical for, you know, like a quote unquote typical wildfire. And same thing in the evening, we had continued activity where typically if a fire has been burning for a while, it does sort of fall into this. Uh, up and down diurnal pattern, which we didn't see. And so the smoke forecasting system failed. So using that tool, we were able to develop uh, emission estimates for um, most of the, the large fires for 2018 in California. So um, use that uh, uh, sort of hour by hour area burned information um, to Susan. And I'm going to give it back to Susan to, to talk about that uh, effort. Thank you for your attention. Okay, great. Thanks. So working with Sean um, and working with others on the uh, Tiger team, um, we started putting together uh, fire emission estimates for 2018 in California because 2018 was another big fire year in California. And so um, working with the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, um, and Sean, we've been using his um, tool and emission, um, you know, diurnal profile estimation methods to um, have diurnal pro to use to take the GO16 data and use the diurnal profile information then to it within the blue sky system to calculate fire emissions and ultimately to try start putting it into some smoke modeling. And so we've we're using this for um, the 18 uh, wildfires in Northern California, or excuse me, in California for 2018 that were greater than 12,000 acres in size. So we're just using it for the larger wildfires. There's still issues with the GO16 data as far as false detections. So um, we're using this approach specifically for the uh, larger wildfires. And so those acres are totaling about almost one and a half million acres total with these 18 um, wildfires. And you can see a map on the right of what those of what those fires were. So like the Ranch River um, fire it was a complex of fires known as the Mendocino complex. And then of course, Sean just took you through the Camp Wildfire. And then there was also 
Delta, Carr, uh, Ferguson, those are some of the other notable uh, fires that occurred in 2018 in California. So we're working on that right now. And then we're also, like I said, we are using that for just the 18 um, larger fires, the ones greater than 12,000 acres. For the smaller fires, we're actually using an approach um, based on years and um, MODIS data. And, um, and this is a, something that, um, you know, Sean's worked on these approaches before in the past. Um, I've been working with our statistician, Amy, in our lab on this particular rendition of it. And really, it's taking, um, it, it's taking uh, the satellite detections from MODIS, from VIRS. And so we have, you know, the SUMI MPP, and then we also have NOAA 20. And so, you know, there's a lot of, these satellites are all seeing essentially in many, you know, in many cases, the same fires. So from multiple sources, we're, we have, uh, for the same fire, we'll have multiple detections. So this, this is a methodology that we're using to kind of aggregate, to, um, you know, overlay and aggregate um, these multiple detections into essentially single detections that can be aggregated together. Um, and so that's a lot of what this, these pictures, this flow here is about, is taking these multiple detections from multiple sources. We create a box around them and dissolve the boxes into a single fire location, and then we go back to the original number of detections, grid things out to a one kilometer on a one kilometer basis to re come up with a reduced number of detections. So in this case, we went from 59 detections to 21 detections on this particular day in August, and um, then assign a fire size based uh, to each of those detections. And then we do do some aggregating back up. Uh, detections that are clumped together, um, and we aggregate right now to a maximum threshold value of about 5,000 acres, because um, we are seeing in some cases fires that could aggregate up to, you know, 20, 30, 50,000 acres, and so we needed to kind of split that apart a little bit. And so for this, um, in this particular effort for California for 2018, for the June through November time period, uh, this is modeling about um, 300,000 acres total in these smaller fire sizes. And so um, that's some of the work that we've been doing. Started with the Tiger team with 2017 work, and it's morphing now into work with um, um, for 2018 for the Cal for the fires there. And one of our um, let me do a time check here. Uh, one of our motivations is, um, and one of our primary stakeholders is the Interagency Wildland Fire Air Quality Response Program. And this is the program that deploys air resource advisors. Uh, to many of the large wildfires. And so I mentioned working with the Air Resource Advisor earlier on the Whittier fire um, and work with many of these Air Resource Advisors sometimes on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So we hope to use this modeling approach um, when needed, working one-on-one -on -one with Air Resource Advisors. Um, 2019, we were kind of all set and ready to go with 2019, but um, it was a very light year. So we're seeing how 2020 is going to shape up now at this point. And so this is just a little bit um, about the uh, about the program. And then another um, piece of work that we've been working on is creating a training video. And many thanks to Dagan Miller for creating this video and being so great to work with on this. Um, so I've been working with Dagan and some other um, subject matter experts on this um, video. And it's a 15 minute online training video, basics of satellite data for smoke and fire. And so it's a very, um, many of you might find it rudimentary, but it's to give an, designed to give an intro to the alphabet soup of satellite data for smoke and fire. Uh, what's a geostationary satellite? What's a polar orbiting satellite? What are the instruments on those satellites? It can be quite daunting um, to hear these terms talked about when you're first getting into, um, into satellite data. And so I, if you're interested, um, you can go watch this video. Um, and, you know, if I, you have any questions, please contact me. And we created a table as well, summarizing um, some of this uh, information, hopefully in an easy, readable manner. So the, it lists on the left uh, the names of the sat of uh, key satellites, the instruments on those satellites, some of the products for smoke and fire on those satellites, and then information about their temporal resolution, their spatial resolution, and um, how long they've been around when they were launched and when they went into production because those can all be pieces of, useful pieces of information as well. 
And then there's also, I just wanted to quickly share um, other web pages that are out there that host, you know, are really great hosts for satellite data and um, specifically for smoke and fire. And so the first one is NASA Worldview. This web page is great. You can go to it for VIRS information, for MODIS information. Um, G, um, Go16 data is now being displayed on the site, and it's a really great way to quickly and easily um, see satellite data uh, for smoke and fire. And we're also um, working currently with Dagan on a short, probably 15 minute um, training video on how to get started with Worldview for smoke and fire as well. So hopefully we'll have that coming out soon. The College of DuPage is a great site if you want to quickly um, look at real time uh, GO16 data, for example. And this just shows the data that's the most, red, you know, that's there in real time. It's not a retrospective tool. But the beauty of this page is that it's fast. You can go, you can click, and you can, um, you can get at what's currently going, what the GO16 satellite is currently seeing from this page. Um, other websites are not so quick. Here's the uh, CIRA, um, Colorado State University CIRA oh, RAM slider um, web page. And this is, um, this is a great web page to go to for visuals as well uh, for many of these products. Um, but be patient. Uh, it can take a while for things to load. You need a good internet connection. And then there's the NOAA Aerosol Watch web page, which is another really great web page for viewing, um, let's see, GO16, GO17, um, VIRS data. And what's nice also is that you can overlay um, the surface PM2.5 monitoring stations with this data. So you can um, animate through the data and see also how surface concentrations change as well. Because what the satellites see is not always what's at the surface as well. And people sometimes, um, that gets lost sometimes. Um, NOAA Hazard Mapping System has been around for a while. It's been great. Um, then there's also the Forest Service hosts um, data where you can um, host the web page, the Geospatial Technology Application Center, where you can go and get um, beers and MODIS fire detection, download them quickly into Google Earth. The JSTAR Mapper is a new tool that's just come online recently um, that is, uh, in this case, it's um, what's right. Uh, Playing um, tropomi data, so you can start seeing the two-kilometer resolution uh, tropomi data uh, for carbon monoxide. And for example, here's a plume that was uh, that was in Northern California. Let's see, it was September eighth. Um, oh, I forget the ah, the name of the fire is escaping me at the moment. And then there's also the University of oops, University of Wisconsin, and then the NASA RSET um, has a lot of really great training on um, how to access satellite data uh, for, uh, for many applications, for many air quality health applications, smoke and fire included. And so with that, I just wanted to mention, the final thing I wanted to mention is that there's two conferences coming up, the International Smoke Symposium the third, and the third Fire and Forest Meteorology um, AMS, American Meteorological Society Conference. And um, given what's going on with the coronavirus these days. Um, it's, um, things are um, making things hectic and challenging. Um, but for example, the Smoke Symposium has decided to go 100% virtual. And um, there already was, was um, a large virtual component to the symposium, and now they're going 100% virtual. And I think actually it's still going to be an exciting symposium. So I encourage all of you, if you're interested, to go register and check that out. And so far, as far as we know, um, the AMS conference is still a go in May in Palm Springs. And let's see, one thing about the smoke symposium is that um, about a third of the presentations um, mention smoke and remotely sensed data. Um, and they cross all platform, all tracks of the conference. So I think it'll be interesting from that standpoint as well. And then I mentioned that some of our, um, some of the other HECAST webinars that have already occurred, um, Jason West and Ming Wei Dao um, did some great presentations earlier that included some of, you know, work for Smoke and Fire and the Tiger Team effort. And then also Brad Pierce did a, um, a really great presentation recently um, with his webinar uh, talking about the uh, IDEA app platform 
an application that's been under development in different variations for, for a while now, for many years. And he had a really great analysis of the vertical distribution of smoke and using this platform to get at that vertical uh, distribution information. And so with that, I will stop and um, if there's any questions.